I'd like to welcome you all to the third of four webinars in UC Irvine Extension's fourth annual GATE webinar series. Tonight's topic is identifying, serving, and enfranchising our culturally and linguistically diverse gifted students. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available within 24 hours. If you register through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive the email, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation will be listed with other recordings so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I am a program representative here at UC Irvine Extension. Tonight I am logged in on behalf of my director, Angela Jante. Here's a brief overview of what we are going to cover in this webinar session tonight. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features so that you'll know how to submit questions to our featured speaker throughout the presentation. Next, I'll provide you with some information about several GATE resources offered through UCI Extension, including our fully online Gifted and Talented Education Specialized Studies program. I will cover the requirements for the program, fees, and some upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 26th. I will then hand it over to Dina Bruyas, who is our speaker tonight. Dina will be presenting on tonight's topic, Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Gifted Students. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I will leave you with our contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar tonight, please shoot a chat message over to UCI Robert, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Dina regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the Q&A box, and we will address it at the end if we have time. If you look at the top um, of the participant list on the right-hand side of the screen, you should see a row of icons. Go ahead and press on the question mark icon, and the Q&A panel will show up. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Here is a brief overview of the GATE Specialized Studies program we have here at UCI Extension. Our certificate program is fully online and consists of nine quarter units. Students have the opportunity to pick from a variety of electives with different unit values to make up those nine units. Our program is taught by a team of experts and is designed for individuals new to the field as well as current GATE educators seeking professional development opportunities. To be eligible for this certification, students must complete all nine units with a grade of a C or better, as well as a completed request for a certificate. The courses in the program range from $350 to $500 per course, depending on the unit value. You may take individual courses without pursuing the entire certificate program. Here is a list of the elective courses that make up our GATE program. Regardless of which electives you choose to satisfy the nine unit requirement, our program will help you develop a new skill set and gain a deeper understanding of the needs and issues of this diverse group of students. When viewing the course schedule, you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Pay close attention to the unit value of each course because this dictates the course fee and how long each course will last. For example, you can expect Learning Styles, which is a one-unit course, to last four weeks online and cost $350, while Differentiated Instruction, a three-unit course, costs $500 and lasts 11 weeks online. 
The nice thing about our specialized studies program is that you can earn your certificate in as little as nine months, and you can choose only the courses of greatest immediate interest to you. Here's a list of the courses we are offering in the upcoming spring quarter. Differentiating instruction at three units, learning styles at one unit, and the arts and gate education at two units. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information is also posted on our website. Registration for spring courses is currently open, and students may enroll either by calling the number on the screen or by enrolling online at the URL listed. We encourage students to enroll in classes at least two weeks prior to the course start date. UC Irvine Extension also provides individual courses, specialized in-services, and the entire GATE certificate program on-site or online to schools and districts at reduced prices. We currently work with several school districts who are putting cohorts of teachers through our GATE program and are receiving 10, 15, and 20% off course fees. With one district, we send our university approved instructors to teach the classes on site at their district office. With other districts, we provide customized online courses available only to teachers from that particular school district. In any case, we hope that there is an opportunity for UCI Extension to meet your GATE training needs. If you wish to le learn more about our program and discount offers, please email me or call 949-824-9304. As you may already know, UC Irvine Extension hosts an online GATE community that is free and open to the public. Please follow the directions on this slide to become a member, and you will gain access to valuable resources, news, and events regarding GATE. Recordings of all of our past webinars are available through the community, so I do encourage you to join. And we're currently on our third webinar of the series. There's one more next week, and we have already done two webinars the past uh, two weeks. And all of the webinars from this web this series um, from this year will be posted to the online GATE community at the end of this month. Next month, California Association for the Gifted, commonly referred to as CAG, is hosting its 50th Annual Conference in Palm Springs, California. UC Irvine Extension is proud to be a credit provider for this event. In order to receive one unit of credit, individuals must attend the CAD conference, submit an official enrollment form with $120 payment, and write a two-page reflection paper summarizing what you learned at the conference and how you will apply what you learned to your teaching practice. The deadline for all submissions is April 4, 2012. Not only can this credit be used as proof of professional development for salary advancement, it can also be applied toward UC Irvine Extension's GATE Specialized Studies Program. For those of you who are attending the conference, please look for the enrollment form at our, at our table or email me in advance. Okay, to wrap up my portion of the presentation, hopefully you saw some courses that piqued your interest, and we hope that you will consider adding our fully online GATE program to your credentials. This slide has my contact information, as well as my directors, so please feel free to contact us with any questions. Tonight's presenter is Dina Bruyas who is the Director of Gifted Education Services in the Paradise Valley Unified School District in Arizona. She is also very active as the Coordinator of Gifted Programs at ASU and serves on SANG's Editorial Board, Diversity Committee, and NAGC's Equity and Diversity Committee. Dina will be presenting tonight on the topic Identifying 
serving and enfranchising our culturally and linguistically diverse gifted students. So I'm going to go, go ahead and hand over the presenter ball to Dina at this time. Dina, can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to be talking on my one of my favorite topics. This uh, is near and dear to my heart because I actually work with the teachers, with uh, administrators, trying to develop programs and services for culturally and linguistically diverse students. And I was also a bilingual gifted teacher um, prior to becoming an administrator. So my background is pretty diverse, and this topic will probably ideally would last about a week. So it's a very, very brief overview, but hopefully you'll be able to gain some insight. But I'm going to into this vast, vastly needed um, topic. First of all, I'd like to let you know I am the author of several books, uh, all that really do focus on this group of students. Some of you may be familiar with the with nonverbal ability test I co-wrote, Helping All Get the Children Learn, a teacher's guide, guide to using the results of nonverbal ability test with the author of the NNAC, Jack Nagleri and Kim Lansdowne, the cluster group and handbook with Susan Weinbrenner, and a new book that's coming out uh, in July, Teaching Gifted Kids in Today's Classroom, is a revision of Susan Weinbrenner's past book, Teaching Gifted Kids in the Regular Classroom. The reason I want to share this information with you is because these are resources that particularly uh, appeal to teachers who are trying to enfranchise culturally and linguistically diverse students. So today we're going to be talking about what the different tests actually measure, what the, dif the various the faces of gifted children, how do they're the same and different, and how the identification relates to their learning needs. Finally, the most, one of the most important things we do is what can we do with these students uh, as far as related to gifted programming and how do we find an optimal match for them in our schools? What are some of the services we need to look at and consider? First of all, we need to start off by saying, by understanding that there is no universally agreed upon uh, definition of giftedness. Giftedness is in talent, intelligence, they're fluid concepts, and they look very different in different contexts and cultures. Even within a school, you'll find a range of different beliefs about what gifted means. And it's a term that has, um, takes on its own meaning in different situations. Unfortunately, many times we identify st students as gifted if they fit into our existing programs. So some of what we're going to be talking about here is how to first identify the gifted students and then create the services that are an optimal match for those students. One of my favorite definitions is from Francois Gagné, who says that giftedness designates the potential and use of untrained and spontaneously expressed natural abilities. That is a very important word, natural abilities, and at least one a domain. By contrast, talent designates the superior mastery of systematically developed abilities or skills in certain areas. Go back to the top the uh, description there of giftedness, and we will you will understand that giftedness is an innate ability that people are born with. It's a natural ability. And we need to bring that out of our students. We need to develop that potential, that talent, um, in order for, for students to, uh, to reach that potential. We also need to remember that giftedness is found in all ethnic and socioeconomic and cultural groups. A lot of times in our schools, we end up with a maybe unrepresentative population of students in our gifted programs. And a lot of times that comes because we are not using the right tools or providing the right services that are going to be inclusive and enfranchise these groups. So when we're talking about uh, identifying students as gifted, it, wow, if you go to 10 different school districts or 10 different states, you're going to probably find 10 different variations of how schools identify as gifted. One of the important things that I like to um, 
point out to people is that there's a very big difference between ability and achievement. Ability is potential for learning. Ability is measured by IQ tests or ability tests. Achievement tests measure what a child already knows, what they've already learned. So we're going to have a fair amount of gifted students, hence high ability students, who may not have yet mastered some of the content or the curriculum that we would have liked them to measure. So, But they have that potential. They have that ability. Very important distinction there. A lot of high achieving students are not gifted, and they will never have that be identified as gifted in a true measure that measures ability or intelligence. But their smart kids do well in school and achieve highly. My goal as an educator is to help gifted students with high ability develop that achievement, those levels of achievement that are commensurate with their ability. We need to have structures in place in our schools in order for that to happen. And we need, like you, teachers who understand what those needs might be. Why do we test anyway? We need to test to learn the, about what the student's learning needs are, strengths and weaknesses as well. We test to help identify children for placement into a gifted program, and sometimes the testing also will give us an indication of some uh, learning disabilities. The most important reason for testing is to help advocate for appropriate educational accommodations for those students who need them. And when we talk about gifted kids, we're talking pretty much around 130 IQ, and that's about three in 100 students. A lot of those really smart kids that are high achieving, that, they, that we um, but do well in school, those are the kids a lot of times between 110 and 130 IQ, and it constitutes a large proportion of our students in our school. And these kids are generally quite successful because they are within that norm. And when I say within the norm, right around the where the blue arrow is pointing to at 130 IQ, if you go up to the top, you'll see 95% of our students are within two standard deviations from the norm, the norm being 100. These kids between 115 and 130 IQ do really well in school because they fall within that norm, that normal range, and they are in the school, the curriculum in the schools is really set up so that with these smart kids between 115 and 130 IQ, they're going to be challenged within that within that normal curriculum, maybe um, at a little higher level than other students in, in that classroom. But when you go outside of that 130 or beyond, I should say, 130 to 145 IQ, that's where that's where most of our gifted students are. Those that are over 145 are those that we call highly gifted. Go back to that midpoint range, 100 IQ on this on this uh, scale. If you go look at two standard deviations to the left and you're around a 70, once again go straight up 70 to 130, that's pretty much considered average in our schools, lower average, average, and high average. However, when you dip a little bit below that, these are the students that uh, there are three standard deviations from the norm. These are the students for whom they, other constructs are in place in our schools to assist in their learning needs. And it is critical that we have those, those um, in place. There's a federal mandate. There's federal funding. There's state funding. Well, most states have very little funding for gifted students who are equally removed from the norm but yet on the other side. These students um, also have learning needs that fall outside the norm. So that's, but because there's no federal funding or federal mandate, there is very little funding for the, for this, this group of students. So, but when we think about culturally and linguistically diverse students, even less, because these are the ones, the students, that are harder for us to identify their ability a lot of times because of their diversity. 
their cultural background might not appear similar to others, so we don't always understand them. They might not be fluent in English, so therefore they might not do as, as well on certain IQ tests or ability tests. Popular tests for you used for identifying gifted students are ability tests and intelligence tests, like I mentioned, and the most two commonly used tests in the schools are the Cognitive Abilities Test, the COGAT, and the Nagleary Nonverbal Ability Test, the NNAT. I use both in my school district. In my school district, we have about 50 schools, and within those 50 schools, we have a third, maybe, that are high SES, a third in the middle, and a third that are low SES or title schools. We need to have different measures that identify the different populations of our gifted students because not one measure will, will identify giftedness in all students. So we want to use multiple measures. The best measure is an intelligence test. An IQ test um, is made, needs to be met, administered by psychologists. And in most states and most school districts, um, psychologists are not, school psychs are not uh, employed to administer IQ tests for gift identification, but rather for special ed. Um, however, a lot of parents will go outside and get psychologists to administer the IQ test. But in reality, it's the ability test that the schools use most. And when we talk about ability tests, these are tests of general ability. The content of the activities on the test may vary, but they all require general ability. I'm going to talk a little bit about this because it's a very um, misunderstood concept. Tests of general ability are, can be divided on the basis of the content of the questions, verbal, quantitative, or nonverbal. They're the most common in the ability test. But that does not mean that different abilities are being measured. We are still measuring general ability. So why are the tests broken into these batteries? Because some kids are going to do better on a construct of a test item that's verbal. Others will do better on a construct of a test item that's quantitative, and others nonverbal. I'm, I'm pointing out the, the COGAT now because the cognitive abilities test does break it down into these three areas. I'm going to go over this pretty quickly, but I just want to point out to you that the, in the verbal battery, there's three different areas, verbal classification, sentence completion, verbal analogies, very language um, laden. Quantitative battery, the three different sections, quantitative relations, number series, equation ability, building. And in most of these situations, most of these batteries, they are also, there's a lot of language involved. The nonverbal uh, battery on the COGAT, figure class classification, figure analogies, and figure analysis, once again, there's a tremendous amount of language involved in the administration of these tests. This is a fantastic test. I use it in all of my schools. Uh, but it's not the only test I use because it's not always going to identify all of our culturally and linguistically diverse students. So for that group, I always I also include the NNAT. Um, it's a nonverbal measure of general ability that is predictive of academic success. So I want to make sure that I'm identifying, I'm, I'm being as fair to the students as possible, and so that's why I want to use both tests the, for multiple measures. The NNAT is a culture fair nonverbal measure of ability that does not require any reading, writing, speaking. Um, it uses abstract figural designs. It does not rely on any verbal skills or achievements. Let's take a look at a couple of the questions. Okay, this is what a student will see when he's taking the test. Obviously, the answer is two there. Next, answer number five. Here now we have three different um, attributes. We have color, shape, and orientation. That previous one, there were two. The one before that, there were one, one different attribute. So this one is going to be four. Here we have another way of looking at it. Okay, and here the answer is basically you're adding these slides together and you get the third one. You're adding the first two slides, you get the third one. So the answer here will be two. And here we have to do look. 
and decide what is the pattern, what are we looking for, what is the relationship. Let's see, black border, yellow border, blue border, first row, second row, yellow, blue, black, third row, blue, black, border must be yellow. Then we look at the three shapes and we decide that the answer must be three. And they get very, very complicated. Some of them require where the students have to figure out what it is that they're asking and then complete the pattern in that one. This one was three. Using nonverbal assessments then. General ability is measured using this so that um, many individuals can be assessed using the same sets of questions. And they're more appropriate for culture and linguistically diverse populations. One thing that um, Dr. Naglieri and I get asked frequently is, oh, so the nonverbal test must measure part of the ability, the verbal versus nonverbal. We also get asked, is there validity in that? And what does, it, what does that tell us anyway about the, about the child's learning? I'm not going to go through the research because there's a ton of it, but I want to let, point out that the summary of the nonverbal test, especially the NNAT, um, shows that there's a strong relationship to achievement, small race and ethnic differences, similar identification rates for gifted children, similar scores uh, for children with English, limited English. So basically, we want to use this as part of the process to identify our gifted children to make sure that we are not missing some of these kiddos. Nonverbal assessment, it describes, it, this, is, this is really a um, misunderstood concept. It describes the content of the test that's used to measure general intelligence. It's not a theoretical construct of nonverbal ability. I'm going to explain that a little bit more in a minute. There's no assumption that nonverbal as opposed to verbal abilities are being measured. Remember, I had mentioned that these ability tests measure G, general intelligence. It relates to IQ. It correlates, I should say, but it measures general ability. Basically, it's the construct of the test item that makes it verbal or nonverbal. And what does this mean for schools? Well, when I was in my previous school district, and I was in Glendale, Arizona, I was asked to uh, to come in and take a look at our the population of gifted students that we were serving, and it was quite scary. We we looked. what we did. What I noticed was I don't know if you can see this well enough. In the year 2000, when we started this, we realized that two. 0.67% of our population was identified as gifted. It's rather low. The state average was 8. What we did then was we incorporated a nonverbal test plus cluster grouping model, both of which enfranchised these populations. And year after year after year, our, we saw our numbers increase. Now, I should point out that this district was about 78% Hispanic at the time, high ELL numbers, very low SES school district. So how did this growth occur? Just by using a nonverbal ability test? No, we also wanted to, to provide inclusive type of, um, of programming so that once we identified these gifted students, we also served them and we helped develop that potential that we talked about earlier. So when we looked at those numbers in year one, about 237 of our students were white, of our gifted students, and about 70 were Hispanic. Well, I just finished telling you that 78% of the population was Hispanic. So we were doing a really good at job identifying and serving our white kids, and not that great with our Hispanic students. After incorporating these two methods for identifying a nonverbal ability test plus using cluster grouping. Each year, this, the number of Hispanics increased until year six. The Hispanic population of gifted students actually reflected the district representation of that ethnic group. So we had, by the end of the six years, the white students continue to be identified using this nonverbal ability test. Of course, we also use the COGAT. But that 
it, they, it didn't do a disservice to these students, but what we did see is a huge leap in the number of Hispanic students that we were identifying and serving. So let's switch gears again. General ability is what allows people to solve problems that involve words, pictures, numbers. It doesn't matter what they involve. It's general ability. They might not be fluent in English, but if with high general ability, you can still solve problems. If you're using the language, your own language, your own working through things. These problems that we solve, they involve reasoning, memory, sequencing, verbal and math skills, patterning, connecting ideas across and within content, making um, connections, insights, drawing inferences, and analyzing simple and complex ideas. So that problem solving relates to every single thing the child does in school, not just one content area, not just acceleration. We'll talk more about that in a minute as well. When you were looking at those puzzles, the, the, um, the uh, test items, what were you doing? You were making relationships between the different Thing, uh, uh, different test items. You were gifted students acquire and retain information really quickly. They're able to process information much more quickly than others. So when the gifted students are taking that test, a lot of times they just boom, they see the answer. They don't know how they got it, or maybe they do, but they see it really, really quickly. So timing is part of that uh, identification piece when they're working through a test. Um, that's, how, that's how they learn as well. Students see things really quickly. They make connections. And that's why they may need more accelerated pace or more depth than other students. Another thing that we see commonly in gifted students, and maybe even more so in some culturally and linguistically diverse students, at least some, some people believe so, is that a lot of these people are holistic thinkers. And this is just thought very, what it means is they see holes apart. So when I was talking to you just right now about how they answer those questions, they just see the answer. Well, this is how kids think in school as well. They just see the answer. And a lot of times when we say, hmm, doesn't work unless you show the work, your work, then they have to go backwards and try to reconstruct that their answer based on the way the teacher was teaching, but they did, their brains didn't learn that way. Their brains just saw that answer. These kids are not very sequential learners um, a lot of the time. They don't, and by this I mean they don't always go step one, step two, step three, step four. A lot of times they'll go, their brain goes A to D to L, jump to Y, then they just have to go back back to G, then they're over at P, then they're going to go back to D because they miss some things. This is not unusual for the way you get the kids think. But our curriculum, our resources in school, our lessons are all laid out sequentially. We follow that. And so sometimes the gifted students will tune out maybe or they'll get frustrated by the, the pace or the, um, the, the method in which the teacher is teaching. So sometimes they're not going to work or sh up to their potential or at least show it if we try to make them learn as if they were an average student. They're not average. They learn differently. They see solutions without using the same steps as others. They interweave concepts and ideas together. A lot of times they think faster that they can write. And so they have poor handwriting, or they miss putting information down on the paper that we would like to see because their brain has moved on to the next really interesting or exciting topic or uh, just moved beyond. So sometimes these kids are not going to be completing as much work as we would like them to do. What if they're not fluent in English? They're understanding some concepts maybe, but they're not able to produce in the same way that a fluent, uh, an English, a native English speaker would, would produce. All gifted students have, un, well, I shouldn't say all, but most of them have uneven development. We'll talk about more of that in a bit. But holistic thinkers, a lot of times, they like to interweave concepts and ideas. And that's why project-based learning is really effective with a lot of gifted students. They get excited about learning. And going through this list, 
Have you ever seen gifts of students in your classrooms where we say, okay, let's close the English book, now we are going to do math? Well, I'm sorry, but they were really excited about what they were doing in that, that story, that English class, that, that lesson, and they're not ready to make that transition to math because their brains, or they take things deeper, information deeper into um, uh, interesting areas, and so transitions are hard for them a lot of times. And asynchronous development, I won't spend much time on this, but it means that we develop at different rates. That their development is, is not in sync as it is with average students. But what does this look like with culturally and linguistically diverse students? Their thinking might be um, at a different advanced level, but their skills are not. Another way of looking at asynchronous development. When we look at culture and linguist CLD students, we these are students that typically acquire language at a very, very fast pace and with a lot of ease. A lot of times we will see these kids move through those levels of language acquisition much more rapidly than their peers. I, in my schools, I always work with our ELL teachers and the testers. I want to give them a gifted 101. Here's some characteristics of gifted students, especially CLD students, because I want those teachers who are working, providing those that language acquisition test to point out to me which students I need to get tested on a nonverbal ability test they see things um, in these students that other classroom teachers might not because they may have more uh, background with uh, ELL students. A lot of these CLD students, um, they may be, maybe they have incredible creativity, um, but in certain areas, strong leadership skills in their own culture or somewhere, maybe on the playground. They want to hone those leadership skills into the classroom as well show ability in fine arts or practical arts. Some, so I also work with our special area teachers. I do the same thing. I have them go through their class list and go through checklists and nominate students for testing who show exceptional skills in certain areas or attention to detail, for example, in art or in music, where the classroom teacher might not see that because their school is based so much in language, but some of these special area teachers might see some strengths in talent in the students, um, as these CLD students. So we want to we want to reach out to that those teachers because once we identify those students, then the classroom teacher will say, "Oh, wow, yeah, I didn't really realize that as much." A lot of these kids just have rich imaginations and informal language, we want to help develop that into school-based learning as well. Many get the students, look at this list of, and this is not new, and I'm going to go through really quickly. My point here is that, is that the characteristics of gifted students encompass everything that they do in life, everything they do in the school. It's not one class. It's not 40 minutes on Thursday when there's a pull-out program. We want to look at trying to recognize these kids as being gifted all day, every day. They learn differently, and they don't have to go through the same sequential steps that other students do. But at the same time, a lot of what we do in school, once we understand that these kids are gifted and some of the characteristics, there's a lot of strategies that we use in school all the time. If we just connect it with those, some of those strategies with what we know about gifted students and their learning needs, we're going to have a better impact, a stronger impact on their learning. Just a couple examples. Get the students um, process information really quickly, so a lot of them need acceleration. Make generalizations. We need to use holistic approaches when we're teaching. Um, require a little direction, so a lot of gifted students do need student-directed learning. These learning needs, these are things that we do in the classroom all the time, but we need to realize how the, much how they relate to the characteristics of gifted students. We also have to know, remember, that gifted students, there's no typical gifted student. Um, and a lot of these character categories of gifted students are ones that will get left out of programs quite a bit. CLD students are not the only ones that get overlooked. Twice exceptional, non-productive, but creatively gifted students. So what are we looking at in a program, an effective gifted programming? First of all, we know 
flexible grouping is important because all gift, not all gifted students are advanced in all areas. And we flexibly group for learning interests and abilities, learning styles as well. We know that gifted students need differentiation. And one of the things we forget is that continuous progress is critical. This is the group of students in our classrooms that is least likely to make continuous progress, meaning they've typically mastered a fair percentage of our, of our state standards, but if we just test them at grade level, we are never going to actually see that growth. So we have to remember, look at different ways of assessing where these students are. Intellectual peer interaction, we know that gifted students need to spend time learning together because they challenge each other, they motivate each other, they connect with each other, get the kids to feel better when they're learning with other gifted students because they feel more normal. And this does this crosses all those different groups. Not just CLD students, not just um, your average gifted student, it's gifted period. They like to spend time learning together. So we want to make sure that our CLD students have equal time learning with other gifted students and that they are not uh, segregated or separated or they are not left out of certain programs. Continuity, by this we mean gifted, gifted doesn't begin in third grade when your pull-out starts. It begins as soon as the child is identified. And the very most important thing about gift, effective gifted programs is teachers like yourself who um, have specialized training in gifted education, and that needs to be ongoing. So what's, what we're going to talk just briefly about some of the different programs and how these programs impact, um, the impact of these programs on gifted students. Self-contained gifted programs, a lot of times these are designed for highly and profoundly gifted children who are accelerated. And in the, the self-contained gifted programs, if the children are not high achieving, they might not be included in these programs. Well, there's a lot of CLD students are not high achieving only because they haven't yet acquired the language. But we know that they are very smart. They have very they have high ability, and we want to help them develop that potential. So we have to be, we have to be careful that we are not excluding. If your school has only self-contained, we have to make sure that it is inclusive of all students. One very inclusive model, which I am which is near and dear to my heart, is, is uh, cluster grouping. And that is the, the model that I have written on quite extensively. Because of my mentality, my philosophy of wanting to make sure that we are enfranchising all gifted students, this is a preferred model for, um, for doing just that. Because once identified, the students are placed into the gifted cluster classroom, whether they are speak English, whether they are high achieving, whether they're twice exceptional, whether they want to be there or not, we identify and we place because there's a lot of benefits for that. I encourage you to look up, uh, read Cluster Grouping Handbook if you want more information on that. Pull out services. When we pull out students, it could be for a variety of different reasons. It could be for enrichment, it could be for honors, it could be for project based. Um, and pull-out services are fantastic, but the problem is a lot of school districts are eliminating these because of funding. It usually requires a different, um, another staff member. Impact on CLD students really depends, is determined by what is occurring in the pull-out services. A lot of pull-out services, like in my own district, we use cluster groups, we use all of these, but one of the, sometimes they're of constant replacement or honors classes. And the problem with this with CLD students is that the, cons the curriculum is usually very accelerated, which it should be because gifted kids need accelerated curriculum. But if that child, that ELL gifted child, has not yet acquired proficiency in the language, they won't be, ex they won't be included in that type of a class. Uh, twice exceptional programs, there's very few. I'm one of the people that have them, but it's for children that have an IEP. Uh, for special ed and also gifted identification. There's, we typically see few kids in CLD kids in these programs a lot of times because they're not looking for the giftedness when we're looking at um, concerns just because that population is less identified. So we have all these wonderful models, but if your school or district doesn't have the model, that's okay. Jane Claremont at NAGC says that all gifted is local. 
And that means because there's no uh, federal mandate, there's no state funding in many states, including my own, sometimes even the district is not paying attention to, to gifted. So it comes down to what you're doing in your own school, what you're doing in your classroom. And there's a lot of methods that we can use to address gifted students of all bases in our classrooms. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go through these in depth because they're common ones, but I want to have it all on the PowerPoint so you can consider how some of these different provisions, we call these provisions, not models, um, but impact CLD, CLD students in your classes. Acceleration, faster paces maybe in, in a certain subject area or great acceleration. Flexible grouping is so important and you, because we want to flexibly group our students based on their interests, their achievement levels, their learning preferences, maybe their learning styles, or the content objective, objectives. We can flexibly group within the class, that's what's typically done. Also, though, within a grade level, within even beyond the grade level if we need to. This is a very critical um, component for provision that we can provide our gifted CLD students because they might have strengths in certain areas, but they might really might need some um, scaffolding you know, and some even some building compensatory skills in, in certain areas. Ability grouping, placing students of similar ability in same classes for general purposes. This is fine, except we have to remember to reassess and regroup and not make those groups fixed because that becomes tracking. When we ability group, uh, that we can do it, there's a lot of both effective and academic um, imp um, impacts for benefits for both of for, for those students. Compacting this, that's when we condense the amount of time or material gifted students need. They might not need to go through 25 questions like the average student math questions. They could do the five most difficult first, compact those out, make sure that they have mastered those, and then let them go on. It minimizes the drill and accelerates uh, the instruction for those students. Enrichment is really critical, really important for gifted students uh, because it emphasizes critical and creative thinking, and we know to build 21st century learners, that's where we have to go beyond the straight skill and drill to uh, let these kids have opportunities to go into more depth and complexity in the content area. And a lot of pull-out services are enrichment-based, which is wonderful, but we also want to make sure that, that enrichment connects to our core, our core standards and the core curriculum because that is our, you know, that's, that's part of our purpose in schools. The, I made it through almost. I wanted to also point out to you that there really is no single best way to develop programs for gifted students. They're so varied in their interests, talents, abilities, and learning styles. The programs need to be flexible, dynamic, multi-leveled, and designed to meet the individual needs of each child who reads it, reserves, receives services. The goal is to expand students' abilities, not just to establish a program. This came from Amy for Excellence. Gifted Program Standards by Ladlam, Landrum, Mary Landrum and Beverly Shakley in 2001. I am going to, um, I'm really excited because I actually saved the 10 minutes I was supposed to to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, so again, if you have a question for Dina regarding her presentation, feel free to submit your question in the Q&A panel. And you will find that by looking at the, it depends on what type of computer you have, but typically it's in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Um, above the panels, it'll be a row of icons, and you want to press on the question mark icon. And the Q&A panel will show up, and you could submit your question there. You can also chat your question to us. So if you want to send a chat message to myself as the host or directly to Dina, um, she can see the question on her chat panel as well. So, Dean, I got a question from an attendee, and it says, since our school clumps together GATE students with high-achieving students in what's called an accelerated class, 
Um, what is the best way to support the gate child in this setting? I would, in the, in the presentation when I talked about the provisions, those are things that we can do within the classroom, within the regular classroom. I'd also like to uh, to point out, and I don't know if this goes to show over there, um, strategies such as included in teaching gifted kids in today's classroom and the classroom cooking handbook, these are, these are things that any teacher can do um, pretty easily with just some practice within your classroom. So if you are in a situation where you're, you don't believe that the, that the programs in your schools are really serving all of the gifted students, because mainly those that don't have the high achievement, then um, I would first advocate for, um, for increasing those services to be more inclusive and enfranchise those other students. In the meanwhile, focus on the strategies that we know are good for gifted students and make sure that you are um, providing those to the, those kids in your classroom that need them, that benefit from them. I remember Jane Clarendack says, all gifted is local. Sometimes that's local down into your own classroom. And are there any strategies that you would recommend specifically for CLD gifted students? Any sorry, teaching you, strategies? Are there any teaching strategies that you would suggest specifically for CLD gifted students? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, I included that into one of my into the, one of the slides where I talked about uh, characteristics of gifted students and then strategies, their learning needs. So you can see how those fit together well, um, and the strategies that are in the teaching gifted kids book and in the cluster group we have those are ones that are very, very easy to implement and very um, that needed for, for gifted students. Okay. I have another question from an attendee and it says, if a district decides to alter qualifying criteria based on socioeconomic status, are they using an incorrect test, or is this normal? Okay, can you repeat that once again? Sure. If a district decides to alter qualifying criteria, and I'm guessing that qualifying criteria is whether or not to accept somebody mm -hmm. into a gifted program, or um, is it based, based on socioeconomic status? Are they using an incorrect test, or is that a normal procedure? Okay. Um, in my own school district, like I mentioned, we have six out of 47 schools. There might be some, there's some very high and some very low SES. I want to make sure that in my low SES school that happens to have a lot more um, Hispanic students that I'm using multiple measures, first of all. But even so, the percentage of students identifying in some schools is going to be much lower than others. In my own district because I'm the director of gifted. I get to make a lot of the um, program de decisions. Um, sometimes we include or we lower the rate, the, the range, instead of 97 percentile on the COGET and NNAT. In some schools, we will lower it to 90 in order to include more students and services. However, we don't officially identify them as gifted. We, we use the 97 percent cutoff criteria for the official def definition. But that doesn't mean that we can't include other students in the services who might benefit from that. Okay, great. I don't think I've given you a chance, Dina. If you if you have any other questions, if you want to take a, a minute or two to scroll through your chat panel, I know that some people may have sent questions directly to you that I can't see on my, my end of the screen. Um. In the chat panel, no, I don't. I see some names with a question mark next to it. Are those the ones that you're looking for? Looking at? Um, some people have sent, you know, private chat messages, not in the Q and A panel. So I just wanted to see if you had any, had any on your end. Um, there is a question in the Q and A panel that says, "Could you give an example of when a classroom teacher 
would use flexible grouping as I am not clear on how one uses that. Sure. Say, for example, um, I'm going to give a pretest based on something that I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to ask kids what they know about a certain subject, and then I'm going to rank those in ones, twos, and threes. A one's a lot, two, some information, and three, very little. Those are going to be my three groups that I am going to flexibly group for that content, for that curriculum. Um, another example is, say I am teaching fifth grade when we're doing the U.S. regions, and I'm going to do a, a, a unit where the students have the ability to choose the type of project that they are going to use in order to demonstrate their knowledge. Some kids might use, uh, create an interactive poster board. Some might want to do a skit. Some might want to do um, uh, an essay. Some might want to do a website. Well, I'm going to let them choose their final projects based on their learning styles, another way of flexibly grouping. My gifted students might be in any one of those four different groups. But by allowing the gifted student to choose what types of product, I'm engaging them because they're getting really excited. Oh, I love to do websites, I'm, but I hate to do an essay. If you had made me do that essay, I'm not going to do it, or I'm not going to put much into it. But if I get to do this website, I'm going to learn every, everything as, as much as I can about my region or this or that, and I'm going to invest in it more. So we flexibly group according to ability, interest, uh, learning styles, different ways, and a lot of that is just to motivate uh, and motivate our students, and especially the gifted students who um, want to get excited about a certain project but have their own ideas of how they want to demonstrate that learning. Okay, so hopefully that answered the individual who asked about flexible grouping. And Dina, I also sent you two more questions in your chat panel that oh. um, some attendees had asked. So if you if you want to address either one of those or both of them if you can. We have a few more minutes okay. left so we can maybe take on one more question. This one says, what do you say when administrators say that the certification of EL students already teach teachers how to differentiate and date training is not necessary? I really don't believe that at all. Um, the training that we use, I'm an, I'm an administrator as well, and I do a lot of training in my own school district. The, the training that I use for EL, ELL students is great for ELL students, but I'm going to provide a different type of training for my gifted students. If you would like to look at that, please, you have my contact information on that slide, Paradise Valley Unified School District. If you go to the Gifted Ed website there, and that's um, not the one on the screen here, but it's, it's www.tvschools.com. Dot net slash gifted. You can still get those from Paradise Valley School District. If you go to teacher resources, you will see a link to professional development. You'll see a PDF of the workshops that I provide to teachers in my district for GATE. Now we change these up every semester, including the summer, 25 to 30 different workshops that we provide after school, cost the district nothing or next to nothing, depending on who's teaching it. And But you'll see some of the topics. And these are the things that I feel strongly about that, that, gifted, that teachers and gifted students need to know about. First of all, understanding the learning needs of gifted students, uh, critical thinking, uh, how to contact, how to form flexible groups, social emotional needs. These are, th these are all areas that are not going to be covered in any other type of training because they're specific to the needs of gifted students. And Great, the other question you. is, are you familiar with dual language curriculum and how it may meet, meet the needs of gifted learners? I am familiar. Um, a lot of our, our dual language, though, is really not intended, directed toward ELL students, but more toward English-speaking students who want to learn another language. Um, so I don't know if that is, uh, if, if that's, I mean, that's in my experience, so I'm not sh quite sure um, how that would relate to, to this discussion. Okay. Um, I think that's about all the time we have here today. I'm going to go ahead and 
move to the next slide with um, some more information about our webinar series. Dean, I want to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us tonight on such an important topic. And I'd also like to thank you all for logging in with us, and I hope that you will join us next week on the same day and time as we end our series with the final webinar, Technology Tools for Gate Teachers, presented by Ian Bird. And if you haven't already, please go ahead and register for the webinar by visiting the link on this slide. Thank you again for your participation tonight, and have a great night, everybody. Thank you again, Dina. Thank you all.